Good afternoon, everyone. I know this is post-lunch session, but we'll keep it interactive. So keep everyone awake, yeah? Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, here I'm joined by three speakers. We have uh, Jim Estes, CEO, Dan Sear. He has 35 plus years of experience in multiple roles in telecommunication industries, right, industry, right from building products to deploying products now and uh, changing the world from uh, how the infrastructure is deployed today. We have Vinay Ravuri, uh, founder and CEO of HQ. Again, Vinay has uh, played critical roles in companies like Qualcomm and uh, is now changing the, the way SOC is looked at it. And also joined by Arun Bishweshwaran, CEO of Radisys. And he's responsible for uh, executing Radis' strategy in terms of transforming the telecom industry. Again, Arun has played multiple roles uh, previously with Ericsson. So welcome everyone. Uh, we'll go over a few important questions which I think everybody has their mind. And then we'll open up the floor for questions for everybody. All right. So starting with, I'm sure this is everybody's thinking where 5G is expected to play a critical role from evolutionary and revolutionary capabilities in wireless networks. So we'll look at how this panel symbolizes with the revolutionary nature of 5G networks. Uh, starting with this, I would say, Jim, maybe if you want to start with, how does your approach to bridging the infrastructure with cloud uh, networks changes the traditional network deployments? Thank you. Well, the great thing about this architecture with Open RAN is that we're able to lever a lot of really talented partners and bring it all together in a pretty amazing 5G solution. Uh, we we really have uh, looked at this as a way, I view it as, I call it Tower 2.0. You think of the tower model in the early days, sharing towers was very, you know, no one wanted to do it. And now it's commonplace. And we're now at the next inflection point which is really to share the active infrastructure. And this is what the architecture enables. We can actually have multiple, multiple operators operating on the same radios and sharing that to get the best efficiency and economies of scale, like, like in the tower model, except we're doing it with the base stations. Thank you, Jim. And uh, Arun, maybe if you want to share your views, especially with your experience with Ericsson, how is 5G changing the way how the networks are deployed today versus traditional networks? Yeah, I think that's a good question, Manish. Like we were uh, talking about a little bit earlier this morning, every generation of wireless has been deployed basically for the same use case, which is people talking or watching YouTube videos maybe, right? And I think what we want to see and what the industry wants to see in 5G is a very different way of monetization, but also very different way of serving multiple use cases. At the end of the day, not everybody is driving a German car. And all cities are not consisting only of highways. There are streets and by lanes. And I've, so you've got to have diversity in the way you do things. And that is the beauty of the partnership that we have on stage. You've got a new silicon vendor, a new way of deploying networks that makes it accessible to multiple people, and the role of software coming in. And everything working together, underpinned by the cloud. And that is very, very different from what any other generation has achieved in the past. I think that's the beauty of this. Vinay, you want to add something? Uh, you uh, said it really well. Um, 4G is, 5G is very different from 4G. Um, I call the evolutionary part of 5G is like 4.9G, you know, more bandwidth and all that. But the revolutionary part is to, to uh, enable new use cases beyond the phone. Uh, phone is one modality. You have cars, as, uh, as Arun just mentioned. And there are more to come. Um, and, and this is also a step towards 6G. That's also out there. So, uh, so I do think that even though the revolutionary part of 5G is not seen today, but it is, you know, it's an evolution of these things. It takes time. Um, but it's, it's going to be the non-phone that enables these use cases. Thank you, gentlemen. I think this was very insightful. Uh, let's go over to the next topic. Uh, which is about the scalability of the solution that we're talking about here, especially with respect to using cloud native environment. And in this particular case, we're using GCP. So maybe, Arun, if you want to start with how Radisys is enabling uh, cloud 
infrastructure through 5G RAM application. So, absolutely. I see uh, the basic premise of being able to run RAN software in the cloud is something that we are giving true meaning to. Uh, other people talk about doing it, but they're mostly doing it in private clouds inside telco environments. What we are bringing together is a true public cloud deployment, and that is massive. And you talked about GCP. There is also a component of GDC on the distributed cloud, right? <clears throat> so when you start to put the DU closer to in the, in the GDC to close up deployment, and having the CU run in the central cloud more from a you know, GCP perspective, that simple capability sounds simple, but you got to open up the interface and make sure everything works in a you know, very structured manner. And that is only the first step, because then after that, you can separate the CU into a control plane and a user plane and start to build cardinality in a very different manner. And that is how you start supporting multiple cells, and then you get auto-scaling and everything. Now, if you are a traditional OEM, you have to think about feature parity and how you take your current code base and you start to modernize it. But because we start from a different level, all this comes to us natively. We think about it, you know, and start to go implement it without any baggage behind us. I think that is a huge plus, and I think it's great that Jim and, and Den said is going to take it out into the market and create a showcase that other people will actually learn from. <laughs> so my next question. Exactly. So my next question, Jim, is for you, that how using GCP helps both in terms of scaling, but still ensuring the security and reliability in the shared network infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, just to build on what Arun said, uh, the great thing about working with GCP is I, as operator of this network, don't need to be in the server business. I don't want to own a bunch of bare metal servers and have to maintain them and all the transport and associated costs. So GCP has a global reach. We're levering that. Uh, we can we can take advantage of their scale and all the security features that they've implemented in the cloud. But then now I just have to basically attach the radio to the cloud. And so the, the DU and the CU are running the cloud. And it, it ability to deploy rapidly is, is massively extended beyond having to deploy bare metal servers. So it's a very exciting opportunity. So... And uh, maybe, Vinay, if you can also talk about how does the cloud environment or cloud native applications throw challenges on the SOC? Yeah, uh, it, there are many. <laughs> um, well, first thing is just to reiterate what Arun and Jim just said, you know, the benefits are that it, you know, economies of scale that you uh, and the, the know-how that comes from other applications can be adopted. So hence, it's a more efficient network. Uh, a lot of the software could be reused. So there's a lot of value in uh, not reinventing the wheel all over again, which cellular industry has done too many times. So this is a good way to go. Uh, now, everything eventually has to run on hardware, right? And, and chips. Um, so in, when you run something in the cloud, you try to make it as general purpose as possible because you want to run, run different applications, like not just one thing, but many things. So that creates a, an interesting challenge for a silicon vendor like ours because you, on one end, you want to be very cost efficient, very power efficient. On the other end, you want to be general purpose. These are vectors that pull against each other. Uh, so uh, that's the challenge. And that's why I exist as a company because uh, that's also the opportunity. And traditionally, this is not how things have been done. Uh, so this is... The way our HQ was, uh, was started is that how do we run cloud native applications or take things like containerization, Linux, which is a very common thing, how do you run it efficiently in a modem or in a, uh, a RU or a DU? And that's the model that we built. If you look at the traditional approaches, that's not how they've done. And that's, the, you know, that's also the challenge for us, but there's many more coming because cloud continues to evolve, which means chips that go in it have to evolve as well. So continuing actually on that topic, especially the advancement which is happening in the 5G area from SOC point of view, how is your approach of base station on a chip changes the, the evolution for the current solution and especially helps Densair in the solution which is being discussed here? Densair should say what, how, what they like, but, but we... we uh, uh, we're thankful for the partnership with uh, with Densair and and Redisys. Um, so, the thing that our customers see in HQ 
uh, is that we kind of t- did a clean slate approach. We didn't do this based on our previous generation because we didn't have a previous generation. Uh, first thing. Second thing is we looked at the industry and said, okay, what is the best of breed that I can adopt rather than reinvent? Okay. So for the modem or the communication part, we took risk five instead of reinventing that world ourselves, which a lot of modem companies do. We decided not to do that. So there's some goodness that comes with it. But at the same time, there is software that's out there that has to run on top of our silicon, which needs ecosystem to be there. And things like RISC-V doesn't really have a great ecosystem. So we put ARM on top of that modem, which is inside this ship. So these are decisions we had to make. Now, in 2018, this looked a lot, really strange to everyone, like mixing two different technologies and like this looks more like a computer than it looks like a modem. Today, uh, five years later, people said, oh, well, that was such a good idea. It's like, you know, you're far ahead. Honestly, it was an obvious idea. It's just the industry just needs to adopt what's there. So, Jim, to you, how in terms of using HQ as a SOC of choice, helps you in terms of developing the solution faster and especially as part of your small cell. So, yeah, thank you. Just to build on what Vinay said, uh, the, one of the big things is a significant reduction in cost. So I can build all of this on one chip rather than have a, as many as, as four or five more chips t- uh, to do the same thing. The second thing is, is that I have a radio that I can do multiple uh, bands and functions all on the same one. So I can do CBRS, I can do C-band and I can do band 41 all on the same chipset. So now I can provide a, a, a RU, both indoor and outdoor, that supports both licensed and unlicensed spectrum all in one radio. So it's a pretty dramatic savings because we can share the front hall on that as well. So, Thank you. Arun, back to you. How does it impact the RAN implementation or architecture given that you have more capacity available right on the SOC? Yeah, I was just going to talk about that, Jim. We went and met with Vinay's engineering team at Bangalore <clears throat> over a weekend. Yeah. And uh, on, a Saturday, on a Saturday morning, uh, they opened up the office for us. And uh, sadly, I don't think they were expecting this big crew coming from Radisys. Uh, and when we told people that we were going to go meet with HQ, there were more people who wanted to join us. So we all went into this conference room and we started like asking all these questions as to how does this really work, blah, blah, blah. And then your head of engineering, um, uh, Hari, Hari says, look, hang on for a second. And he brings out a tray that has just come from the factory with all the chipsets. And he says, look, this is what it is. This is real, right? It is dramatic when you think about what a base station on a chip actually looks like. And what you said, Vinay, about having the ARM cores and the RISC-V architecture, running our software with all the experience that we have, compressing it, running in four cores, et cetera. You put everything on one there. The cost reduction that you get in terms of you know having a highly efficient design, this is revolutionary for us because we know how to run it on 20 cores and 32 cores. But when to, when you start to say, hey, everything that you've designed is here in one chip, I think that's that is you know groundbreaking. It's a new frontier for us. Absolutely, I think this not only impacts in general the Densier solution, but also the industry overall in terms of bringing the cost down especially for small cell, right? So uh, coming back to you, Vinay, uh, in terms of the current solution that we're discussing, I'm sure and this audience would have questions about split 6 versus split 7.2. So why split 6 is more effective here compared to 7.2, which is more popular? Yeah, um, you know, in Open RAN, for those that don't know, there are different splits that you can split a base station. 7.2 implements the physical layer in the RU and then the upper uh, phi is uh, done in a DU as it's called um, and in split six with the entire phi is implemented in one place and then you aggregate a bunch of these things into a, a single DU so architecturally if you and and Dense does that and uh, our silicon is flexible it could be uh, cut in any way but it it does have uh, a lot of advantages when you do the split six this way because the front hull bandwidth gets greatly reduced when you do the when you process the whole five. What people don't understand is 
when you're, let's say, downloading something, let's say you're downloading like 100 megabits per second, let, hypothetically, the bits that go in the air is not 100 megabits per second. It's almost like seven to 10, uh, base 700 megabits to a gigabit per second. Uh, if it include the number of antennas and uh, include um, all these things. But so the, so when you have front haul, where you have to transport these bits, it becomes expensive. So that's like almost a tax that you have to pay. So doing more of the radio processing, if you will, or the baseband as it's called, up front, it, it, it essentially reduces the, uh, the cost of deployment, and but also architecturally opens up new applications. Yeah, Jim, so has, how has this helped Densier from a solution point of view, and what were the choices that you had to make between the two? Thank you. Uh, split six is a big opportunity as an operator of a network. So we, Densair, build, owns, operates these networks as a neutral host, and we then provide capacity as they need it to different operators, both on the enterprise side and on the carrier side. Uh, with split six, I don't need to use dark fiber out to all of it, right? So that saves a lot of money. Also, the latency kind of tolerance is much more flexible. So uh, that allows me to to actually run longer runs without having to optimize a network around latency. In indoor, the interesting thing about that is you can many times use existing IT cabling to be able to do the front haul. Then Split Six allows you to do that. If you didn't, if you were doing 7.2, you would have to haul fiber everywhere. So it's a big cost savings. Really drives down our unit cost. It's great. Thank you, Jim. Arun, back to you. Uh, as Radisys, you have seen both 7.2 evolution, work with so many different radios and front hall, and now split six options with small sales. Which do you think uh, suits better from Radisys architecture or even for this particular use case around cloud? Yeah, so I think um, the, the beauty of split six and what we do with HQ is that you have a specialist in the file layer that you completely rely on to take advantage of. So you let... Vinay and his team excel in that domain, and we excel in software, and we run the software along with his core complex. And that brings together an ecosystem of pe you know, people who are specialists in their domain. That is the beauty of Split Six and what we do. But <laughs> you, you mentioned something earlier, uh, Munish, about this being a great option for small cells. Vinay and I have discussed that this could also be a very good option for 7.2, because what you then start to do is to have a single card implementation on which you're running your DU and CU, and you can have a very efficient, power efficient, cost efficient infrastructure that runs at the bottom of the tower. And then comes our flexibility that we have interrupted with a number of, uh, you know, uh, 7.2 radios. And this can start to bring a very different perspective on where HQ technology along with our technology can be deployed. This is not only for small cell deployment, right? As we scale and we go into other kinds of shared infrastructure, macro network deployment, it starts to become a very efficient use case. And if I can do a small pitch for Vinay, the, ab <laughs> the ability to support both 4G and 5G, and this is, uh, you know, Jim, we have talked about this as well, on a single SOC, also starts to become very, very important. As we talk about the evolution of, you know, networks, you know, even here in Europe, for example, people are looking to have at least 4G as a you know, fallback. To go in and say that you can support both technologies, same infrastructure, this is what we talked about yesterday. You can start with a 4G if you want, you can upgrade to a 5G. And over a period of time, you can tune down the 4G, for example. Tremendous flexibility that you get. And, and for, for, you know, rip and replace kind of scenarios, this becomes a very, very efficient way to look at it. So there is a lot of flexibility that we get with these solutions. And then, you know, getting Jim and his team, giving this flexibility to get started in the U.S., I think it's, you know, such a great opportunity. I could. I, I don't need any more sales guys. He's done, he's done it for me. Uh, you know, uh, just to, just to uh, uh, extend to what Arun just said, but well, thank you for those kind words, by the way. Um, you know, we're, ta we're asking uh, about cloud and how this can be used, reused, adopted. If you, if you look at like Google or any of these guys, they don't have different hardware for Gmail versus YouTube versus, it's the same hardware. And not even, it's not, it's just the same hardware. They also, the stack, the software elements, the 
the foundation elements are actually the same regardless of the application. Mm -hmm. So architecturally, setting up a platform, silicon as well as some layers of the software to be common across different implementation of the 5G RAN is key. Because if you look at historically, there are not that many base station companies because it takes forever to build one of those things. And it's like, you know, you need a certain type of mi mindset, you need the expertise, forget all that. If you build this in the right way, then you reuse this platform. And that was the goal of the company as Arun articulated. And that's, that's what we want to see more and more of. Mm -hmm. Actually, leading on to that, I would say maybe, Jim, if you want to share that, the ecosystem that is created with Densair, Redis, HQ, how is it helping reducing the cost and increasing the flexibility for deployments across enterprise and network uh, as well? You know, we see dramatic cost reductions and look at the open RAN architecture because we can use software that's been developed in other places without having to develop multiple times, big cost savings. Uh, the other the other area that we see a lot of cost savings, you, you talked about um, IT world and, you know, the enterprise world. We're bridging the gap between the enterprise world and the mobile network world, right? I mean, this mobile networks were always this thing that was completely unique and then everybody, you know, oh, I don't want to work with the carrier or whatever. We go down this path and we, we can actually make this look much more like an IT implementation for indoors, for example. So especially if you're running split six inside, I don't need to have a bunch of, like you think about it, a DAS system and you're pulling coax all over fiber. We don't have to do that. I mean, one of the things we found is that uh, it scales down much better than DAS does. So if you think about a, a smaller facility, let's say uh, 250, 350,000 square foot office building, uh, DAS is very expensive to do. So that's problem number one. We don't have that scale down issue using this architecture. The second thing is, is that I don't need to bring a signal source to the to the site, everyone. So everyone knows this is a challenge. You need to get the MNO to bring a signal source. They may not think it's important. They don't want to do it. So they're not on your network. Here, we integrate the neutral host to each of the operator's core networks. And now I don't have to do that every time. I do it once and I can reuse it everywhere. So that's pretty significant savings. Thank you, Jim. Maybe, Arun, if you want to build on top of it, how does this ecosystem help in terms of faster deployments and even, again, emphasizing upon reduction of cost for deployments uh, of networks? See, one of the biggest things is, is when, when Jim goes and deploys in special venues, they don't want to have multiple deployments from every single operator in the country. They want to deploy it once, they want to have it flexible, and they want that to be good, right? So it has to cover every single part of uh, the environment. We've talked about some use cases where it's not just about indoor, but it's about also covering the perimeter right outside. The loading dock, for example, right? So you want coverage everywhere and you want it to be as seamless as possible. So for every operator to go in and deploy their infrastructure, it's just a waste of money. You don't need it. And, and having the neutral host concept come in there, make it available, and then taking advantage of, you know, the underlying cloud environment like we have discussed really gets the distribution out there with great penetration. So, you know, the calculation on cost savings is obvious just from pure sharing, but I think the calculation from cost savings in terms of modern technology just accelerates that calculation. Uh, Vinay, coming to you now, uh, apart from giving uh, run for money to the big companies and reducing the cost through your innovative solution, what flexibility do you provide as part of this ecosystem or what flexibility does the ecosystem provide for faster, quicker deployments? Yeah, that's a good question. So other than the fact that we integrate a lot of things and gives you low power and, and all, the, all the, um, the flexibility of the chip that it has, what we have done or recognized was that it's not enough to just build a chip and say, you write your software. So we build a layer one phi that is hardened, ready to go, so you don't have to work on that yourself. Um, one of the bigger companies does do that. Uh, most of them, most others don't. Uh, then on top of it, uh, we recognized that to kind of accelerate these things, so 
you know, uh, we're a chip company. We don't actually have to do layer two, layer three. That could come somewhere else. But we licensed your stack early on, Redis's stack, and we worked on showing that it can be integrated and you can get very high performance. Because otherwise, people see a slide and you can is something that's like, okay, maybe I can, maybe I can't. So getting that demoed and show that this can be done and show proof makes, and I don't want to go build a layer two, layer three stack. That's too much work for a chip company. I want to stay as a chip company. So ecosystem there is necessary. Um, so those are good things. But, but it's also, there's a lot of other things that have to come together over time. Uh, there's, you know, it's not as simple. If you take Wi-Fi, I like to use that example. A wife, like a company like Nightgear, you can, they can take a chip, put it into production in six months or nine months. You know, you can get a Wi-Fi router at home. It takes you 10 minutes to configure that afterwards. And you're done. You probably have to add a few zeros next to that for 5G. <laughs> okay? So it's, so the simplification is that the ecosystem has come together well for Wi-Fi. 5G can also do that. It's just it takes time and we have to have enough players, more players like you, more players like you, uh, that bring this to, uh, to, to some simplicity. Mm. Absolutely. And I think as you simplify things, this also throws other challenges, right? When you create open and flexible architecture implementations, this will throw many other challenges. So maybe we go over uh, the panel in terms of what challenges do you guys face uh, while creating such networks? So this architecture and this approach allows us to do things we never could do otherwise. So um, if I could buy what I just described, I would buy it, but it doesn't exist. In fact, with the 4G and 5G, we had one uh, major mobile network operator in the U.S. called the Unicorn, right? And we're, we're going to build it. And we can only do that because of this ecosystem. But then because we have all these different elements, things like, you know, how do we make sure we have interoperability and, and achieve the right kind of quality of service, for example? So there's a lot of really interesting things in the cloud with GCP that they do on-demand scaling. Instead of doing like traditional QoS, where you, you tag the payload and, and give it, a, you know, though this is more important than that, what they do is actually scale the capacity up and down in the cloud as you need it. It's pretty revolutionary, right? They do it in the IT world every day. You don't even think about it. It's not been really done on this on this part of the world. So that's, that's really good. From a security standpoint, that's the other area we have to spend a lot of time looking at. So we need to go through every element in here, make sure that it, it meets all the security requirements, because we don't, we don't want to create issues with that, right? And that, that's a, a, a key element of this whole architecture is making sure that we have adequate security. So. Yeah, Vinay, maybe if you want to share your thoughts around, especially the challenges by creating these networks, because it's not easy either, right? And especially the industry to accept it, because it's very different the way it is done now. Yeah, uh, like, you know, one of the biggest things is why hasn't o Oran really taken off in a big way is uh, the ecosystem challenges exist. Um, it's it's one thing to say disaggregate and you got this this piece, but then integrating them and making them work uh, in a seamless manner because that's what people buy. They don't buy components. They buy, don't buy segments of things. They buy a solution. Like when I am on my phone, I don't want to think about how this thing is connecting. I just want to make use of it. So, so the the challenges there are many. Um, like I said, the challenges for Wi-Fi existed a long time ago, but they've worked through it and it's seamless. Uh, that still exists with 5G. Uh, it starts from, like, how do you even benchmark a ORAN system is a question. Like, what, how, you take system one versus system two versus system three. How do I compare these things? What are the metrics? Like machine learning, they have this something called ML per. There's no equal under that here. Uh, and who is the systems integrator? How do we, who integrates them? What's the 1-800 number to call? Um, you know, so there are many of the, these challenges that have to be addressed. Cloud native is a good way to do it because then it just goes in the cloud. Nobody knows what happens, but it works. <laughs> so, so therefore, that's a, it's a good way to, uh, to address that because then you're not reinventing that wheel. Uh, but it's going to take time eh, for ORAN to... To be the, the market that you know a non-ORAN market is today, for it to be fully covered, it'll take time because the ecosystem has to get formed around it. 
Thank you, Vinay. Can I add something? Please, please. See, one of the important things, Vinay and I can create technology. At the end of the day, you need a buyer. And you need a buyer who is willing to take it, accept it for what it is, work with it to mature it and deploy it. And I think that's the beauty that we have in this. The biggest challenge, the biggest help we have received is from Denset and also the company that backs you, driven by a philosophy that comes from SIP in terms of, look, you got to get wireless coverage out there for the people who really need it, right? And there is a big movement behind that and modern use cases connecting to CAVNU, et cetera, right? That driving force is needed. And very often what you see is that the, the traditional operator community, even though they talk about monetization, the ability to go in and do these things, take action, put money behind the cost, that is lacking because they're too wound up in their classical way of thinking. I think that is probably the biggest challenge in commercialization of any technology. And I think, you know, Jim and the backing of SIP, you know, that's a huge thing that we have in the ecosystem. There's one other ecosystem partner beyond the one you talked about. It's we have a world-class ODM partner in, in WNC. Okay, and, and Binet introduced us to them. Mouth them this morning with their CEO. They are first class, okay? And we would not be able to get the time of market that we're doing here. We don't have to go build a factory. And they're, they're going to build us in Taiwan for us. But um, it, the whole thing is coming together to deliver what we need. Thank you, Jim. I think that was uh, super helpful. But Arun, back to you. Uh, you avoided my technology. <laughs> giving me off my question. <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> so would still want to <laughs> or otherwise depending on how this goes <laughs> would still like to hear from you the technology challenge of being first in the industry to create open and flexible networks so we we should also talk about some challenges with respect to what the what kind of challenges does it impose in software because software in general people think about is easy right you can do anything in software but the reality when you have to create such open networks so what are the challenges that you face? See, one of the biggest challenges I think we have faced, which is also the advantage here, is when you go talk to a traditional mobile operator, <clears throat> for them to consider you as a software vendor, the first thing that they talk about is feature parity. And it's not feature parity for today's technology. It's feature parity for three generations of technologies. And, you know, common sense it doesn't, it, it, the calculation simply doesn't work. Why would I go create software for 2G technology? But if you put that as an entry barrier, it creates tremendous complications. Because now I have to figure out not only how to create modern software with CU, DU, and microservices and make it cloud native and everything, but I have to deal with the non-standardized, non-open version of monolith for the earlier generations. And I got to make these softwares coexist. That is a very, very big complication for us. I think in this particular case, the big advantage that we have, we focus in on something that is very short, new, that allows us to start with a clean slate approach, similar to what Vinay did, without a lot of the baggage. And then we focus on, hey, how do we make this you know, cloud native, right? So the challenges that have been posed on us, in the case of Denser, not so much, because we don't have that big threshold to cross that allows us to come in with a clean implementation of 5G SA and start from there. And for that, we come in with software that has been designed and tested for that environment, interop tested with, you know, top tier OEMs, et cetera. That product grade that you get from the out the door, that is a big advantage, right? So I think for any new, you know, technology provider, definitely for us from a 5G software perspective, the, the, the challenge to address legacy technologies that was kind of removed in this case. And now we might do something on 4G, but that is still much better than having to go all the way back to 2G. Perfect. I think these thoughts were very helpful and insightful. So I'll open up the floor for audience for any questions. Let's ask some difficult questions, guys. So if, if you would describe the perfect customer for you, right? So because you need to enter with this idea also to to the big operators that are traditional thinking, and this is so new. Would you mind to describe what is your first priority? So there's actually two ways to look at that. We talked about enterprise in the traditional m and environment. Um, initially, we're seeing very large demand on the enterprise side. So many of these enterprises go to the m and 
and they say, your coverage is horrible in my building. Can you help me? And they're like, well, mm, no, I'm for kind of, we don't have the money or we're busy or whatever. So um, there's a, a venue pays model that's developing out there. It's similar to what happened in the UK with Jots originally, where they are basically saying, we'll allow you to rebroadcast our PLMN and integrate your neutral host into our core. But then you go to the venue and the venue pays for the deployment. Okay, so that's one model. They're very enthusiastic about that because they don't have the money to spend on that. Uh, beyond that, uh, it really is now for, let's say, outdoor small cells for capacity and, and for coverage infill. Now we're trying to help them solve a problem that, that they may or may not have the capital to do that. So we bring a couple things. We do build, own, operate, maintain. So we actually will pay for the CapEx, build it, and then we have our own knock and we operate it. And that integrates into their network. And it looks like an, any BAU kind of base station from day one. So they can hand in, hand off all the parameters that you would normally do as if it was a base station that you purchased from someone is there. But it's a virtual base station, effectively. And you're only paying for the part you use. Um, I was quite skeptical that people would be interested in that when, when I first met the investors. Because, I mean, I, I thought, how are we ever going to get these guys to ever even consider it? And it's interesting. At a, at a relatively high level in the organizations, they're, they're very interested in this. But it's then how do you kind of triple that down into the organization within the existing RAN groups and things and, and make it part of the, their new business as usual? And we're actually seeing pretty, pretty good traction on that. But it really is starting more indoor enterprise and you mentioned the near we call it near outdoor so if you think about do the indoor oh, i'm going to cover the parking lot from it's a hotel let's say i'll cover the pool or the, the beach area and all that so you know they're the venues are very willing to pay for that because it's a big part of their customer satisfaction and it really doesn't cost anything to the to the mnos they go put us through validation like they would anything to make sure that it meets all of their requirements. It isn't going to cause problems with their macro network. And then we can broadcast their PLMs and that, and that, that solves everybody's problem. So it's a little, little, little lengthy there, but it's uh it's kind of a two phase or two prong approach. Thank you, Jim. And do you see Jim, just continuing on that, do you see the industry or the tier one operators accepting the fact, especially across shared infrastructure, I'm sure uh, the audience also has this in the mind. As, as I said, I never thought that they would, but a lot of it comes down to just economics and what they have the bandwidth to do. So the fact that we can come in and help them, you know, there, there are things we could do now that they may not be able to do for a couple of years. And you look at 5G, okay, they're rolling a lot of this out on the macro network, but they may not get to a lot of the small cells for a long time. So if they wanted to accelerate part of that, they're actually pretty open-minded again as long as it meets all the requirements that it integrates into their network as any other base station would it's not causing problems with their macro network integrates to their O&M as well so that when there's an alarm it shows up in their knock and ours as well they they see it and they know it's there they can hand any hand off so it's a it it's evolving but there's definitely interest there okay. thank you Jim any other questions anybody yeah Thank you, everyone, for the insightful thoughts. When I have one question for you, uh, uh, how is AI going to change the way layer one is posted on SOC? Your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, who is my perfect customer? The one that pays full price and doesn't ask any questions. <laughs> uh, we look for scale, but um, coming to AI, uh, my investor said, if I say AI once a day, our valuation will go up. So thank you for that question. Um, so <laughs> uh, in my previous job, I was, um, I was at Qualcomm and I worked uh, a bit on the AI part of it. Um, machine learning has a, a, a lots of potential to change um, the, the RAN and software aspects of it. So I look at AI as there are two areas um, in the RAN. One is yeah. how to make 5G or 4G better, 
using AI, meaning implementing the physical layer or layer two, layer three, but use machine learning algorithm instead of the traditional approach, like a scheduler that schedules users, uh, learn a pattern and optimize that. Uh, at the physical layer, understand the spectrum. Um, you know, when you're in low SNR regions, like where the signal is not good, if you can, employing traditional algorithms give you very predictable results, but in those areas, you want to find something different, a much more uh, higher performance results, meaning a single bar on, on your phone, you, but you still want to get a very high throughput or medium throughput in, the, in that. So machine learning actually does a better job there compared to traditional. So we implement things like that. Now, the second bucket, which hasn't yet taken off, is moving machine learning models to the edge, a large portion is still in the cloud. Uh, whether it runs on, let's say, the end device or the closest to the end device being a CU, DU, the RAN in general, uh, there are a lot of <laughs> discussions and work being done here, uh, but it hasn't come through yet. You know, take as an example, you have a a bunch of cameras uh, that are, there's live feeds. You don't want to store things that are not important, but yet you also don't want to send all this to the cloud to figure out what's important, which means ML is a good way to, to summarize these things. But you also don't want that in every camera because that's, um, you want to amortize that or aggregate that rather into a central place, a semi-central place, that's a base station. Uh, that's an, an area, for example. Uh, so there are many applications like that. Um, today, the problem statement is not can machine learning help. Actually, it can. That's not even a problem. The problem statement is how do you implement them in a cost-effective manner? And is there an ecosystem to make use of that so that not everybody has to do it themselves? Um, you know, in the cloud, there is. AWS has one, Google has one, right? Uh, the RAN doesn't yet. I think this was very interesting. Um, anyone else? Any questions? A couple of quick questions. Question number one, Jim, is uh, how does this solution sort of stare and compare if you were to take the current path with uh, advanced distributed antenna systems? It's ubiquitous, right? Do you see any challenges trying to break that uh, strangle hole? So you're talking about DAS for indoor venues, right? Yes. So uh, we we have seen tremendous demand in what I'll call at a small to medium size enterprises. So uh, if you had a building that's what, like I said before, I think let's call it 250, 350 thousand square feet down to let's say 50 thousand square feet, DAS does not scale well at that level. And, it, and even if you installed it, the odds of them bringing a signal source from each of the MNOs is probably not very good, even if you paid for the signal source. So um, because we use the neutral host integrated into each of the MNOs core networks, they they don't need to bring the signal source to the venue. So that's a big thing, but not only in terms of cost, but in terms of accelerating the deployment of it. And then in terms of the, because we're again using standard IT cabling and things versus coax and fiber like you see in a DAS system. That's less expensive as well. And you don't have to amortize the cost of a base station hotel across that particular venue. So it's pretty pretty dramatic savings. I mean, we're seeing in some cases 60 to 70% cost reduction over DAS at the smaller end. Now, it doesn't mean you can't do a million square foot venue, um, but it's that's in that kind of lower end is very, very high demand and, and very significant cost savings over DAS. And that's all. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jim. Anybody else? Uh, if not, then I think we can wrap up the session today. Thank you for the panel for sharing insightful thoughts around how 5G can change the world and especially the networks, the way they're deployed today. And I believe next year we'll see the network deployments, right? So around this and learn about the challenges that we have faced while deploying these and thank you for the audience for uh, you know asking interesting questions thank you everyone <laughs>